What's up, Modern Steaders? We're here with Hannah, the kombucha mama, and she's gonna be talking about how to make kombucha. Yes. How long have you been doing it for? I've been doing it for almost 15 years. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And the number one reason you started doing it? I just, I it was kombucha kismet. I had no idea what it was. A friend introduced it to me, and when I tasted it, I just was electrified by the flavor and the nutrition and yep. all the good things that went with it. Perfect. So we're gonna have her video right here. I love kvass. You do it with the beets or other things? Yes. Salty, earthy. Lemonade. With like a ginger bug or... Awesome. So fermentation seems to be um, catching on, and it's really good because now is when we need it. All right, let me find the right button here. There we go. Hi. Um, so I'm known as the Kombucha Mama. My husband and I have been brewing and drinking kombucha for um, over a decade, almost going on 15 years now. And I first discovered kombucha, I call it kombucha kismet because I feel like we had this chance meeting. The first time we met was at a friend's house in San Francisco. San Francisco was pretty groovy. He showed me all kinds of cool things. The filter on his shower, Soleil, pink Himalayan salt water. I'm like, salt water, why would you drink that? That's so bad for you. But of course, that's now the only salt I use. Um, and one of the things was a table, and on the table were jars covered in cloths, and he goes, that's the kombucha. Never heard of it, had no idea what it was. We didn't even try it, because it was still brewing. But that word, kombucha, 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 just sticks in your mind. So when I got back to Los Angeles, in the early 2000s, I went to Whole Foods. Lo and behold, an entire case of GT's kombucha. <laughs> I pulled the ginger ale off the shelf, and I cracked it open, I took my first sip. And how many people, when they took their first sip, went, little kombucha face, right? It's a fermented tea, so it's got a little vinegar flavor to it. For me, I fell in love with that flavor. I was like, every nerve ending in my body was electrified, and it was like the angels were singing. And that's because I was the girl sneaking the pickle juice out of the pickle jar, even though my mom would yell at me, don't drink that, that's so bad for you. But I was like, I love that salty, yummy, sour flavor. So for me, it just really resonated. And I had that physiological feeling of like, ah, oh, this is something good. But like many people, my thirst outgrew my budget very quickly. And so since I had seen those mysterious jars, I decided to get my own. And being in Los Angeles, fortunately, I was able to find a culture locally and, and get started on my journey. And then I took an Artist's Way workshop. Anyone familiar with the Artist's Way? It's kind of a creative uncovering process. And through that, I realized I really wanted to teach people how to make kombucha. My husband thought I was nuts. He's like, what? It's so easy. All you do is make tea, add sugar. What's so hard about that? And I go, have you seen our SCOBY? Have you seen our culture? It's weird. <laughs> People need an ambassador to help introduce them to this culture and help them realize that they mean you no harm, they mean you a world of good. And so that's where Kombucha Camp was born, as a workshop in my home, and I would teach people how to make it. And uh, very early on we did a video series that was on eHow and Village, and I don't know, it's on some website now, but it's probably had millions of views all around the world. And then in 2007, when blogging became all the rage and was a new word, I decided to start blogging about kombucha. I was very frustrated by the lack of quality information about our product. Everything seemed to have a circular reference, and I wanted there to be facts. Um, so that's when I started kombuchacamp.com as a website. At that time, we weren't really selling cultures, but I get emails and people say, hey, do you have a SCOBY, do you have a this? And so then I put up a few PayPal buttons. And then my husband and I decided to partner. He's from the film industry, um, also known as Alex Kombucha. And he did some videos for me where I was teaching people how to make kombucha. And it was through that happy synergy we realized, hey, maybe we could work together. Um, some people probably think it would be a living nightmare to work with your spouse, but in fact, we think of it as like the original way in which businesses were started in the United States. You came over from a foreign country, and what'd you do? You had a farm, that's a business. You had a store, that's a business. And families work together. It's challenging, but it also uh, gives you an opportunity to really learn how to improve your communication style. <laughs> Uh, but we started working together, and that's when Kombucha Camp, our store, and everything was launched. Now, who remembers in 2010 when they took all the kombucha off the shelf? Right? It was dramatic. It was scary. Like, what the heck is going on? 
This stuff is amazing and delicious and makes people feel great what's happening here. But there was no central trade association or anything that people could go to as businesses to try to um, you know, maneuver the politics of that type of situation. You know, most retailers aren't going to listen to a single brand talk about their product and they want a, a third party. So that's when we were inspired to start Kombucha Brewers International, which is the trade association representing commercial kombucha around the world. We started that association in 2014 with 40 member companies. We're already over 200 in just three and a half years. So if I tell everybody, if you're looking to get into a business and you don't mind hard work and you want to help your community, fermentation of any type is a wonderful enterprise to go into. It is a labor of love, emphasis on the labor, but it can be very rewarding. So we also consult for the industry and, and do great things like that. And then in 2016, after a lengthy uh, writing process, we distilled our knowledge into the Big Book of Kombucha, 400 pages on the subject. So um, anything you could possibly want to know about kombucha that we've learned over our many years of experience is encapsulated in this book. And, um, and now I go around and I, I help educate people because our mission is to change the world one gut at a time. Now it's true that I speak Mandarin Chinese and Spanish, but there is no way I'm going to be able to connect with every, you know, multi-billions of people on this planet. But if I teach you, and you teach somebody else, and they teach somebody else, that's how we're going to create this change, is by working together, like a SCOBY. Uh, and so we, our motto is trust your gut. That's not my gut. Don't do what I do. Don't do what makes me feel good. Do what makes you feel good. And trusting your gut isn't about trusting your taste buds, because they've got chemicals in there to make things taste good and activate parts of your brain. But how does it make your body feel after you consume it? And we think kombucha is a great food that can really help you to feel how things are working in your system so that you can make that more educated decision about what should I be consuming. Because if we've learned anything from looking at nature, it's that when you give an organism the inputs it needs to thrive, it will. Also, we live on a planet that's infinitely abundant. And when, again, we give the things they need in order to thrive, they do. So we really live in a planet of abundance as opposed to scarcity, which is unfortunately the messages we're shown on a daily basis. So we execute our mission with our ethics. We provide you with quality information, so you make informed decisions, you understand, is this something right for me? How do I do this correctly? We follow that up with quality supplies in case you don't have a trusted friend or neighbor in your community that you can source a culture from. We become that quality, trusted source. And then we have quality support, because now you've got it, and you've read all the materials, but you're still freaking out, like, ah, this thing is weird. Am I gonna hurt myself? And so we make sure that we help you through that entire process. And we really, the more I've worked in kombucha, the more it's become clear to me that healthy boundaries are what create a healthy culture. She wasn't as bloated. And that's exactly right. You know, kombucha is something that helps with our digestion. So let's get into what is kombucha. As I said before, it's fermented tea. So we're taking tea, we're taking sugar, we're adding a SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. It's a straight acronym, nice and easy. And um, it's an acetic acid ferment, which is why you get that tanginess. But unlike vinegar, which is typically five to eight percent acetic acid, which makes you know shots of vinegar more viable than glasses, <laughs> giant bottles of vinegar, uh, ours is around half a percent to one percent. So I like to think of it as an easy drinking vinegar. It's akin to yogurt in terms of its trajectory in our culture. So it used to be yogurt was something you had to make at home. It was eaten by old people in the old country and they lived to be old. And so everybody wanted that because we all want to be old at some point. <laughs> and so, um, but it took years before that, that really became this huge multi-billion dollar industry. Now because of social media and the internet and how connected we are, that's why we're able to see this really rapid increase in kombucha consumption. And because we're really dedicated to preserving the raw, unpasteurized nature of kombucha, we hope that we maintain that microbial diversity. So unlike some yogurts, which are just pasteurized milk with three strains and a bunch of sugar, not really giving you that original diversity or what you're looking for, we're hoping that people are still making authentic kombuchas and that you're having a, a, a physiological experience when you consume them from the store. But if you're not, that's a great reason to make it at home. 
So the SCOBY is our mothership. This is what we pass from batch to batch. It has like the template of all the organisms present. The other thing that's really important is the starter liquid. So starter liquid is just fermented kombucha. So with your first batch, your first time, when you get that culture from a friend or from kombucha camp, it's going to come with starter liquid. And that's really important. You have at least one cup per gallon. And then that's going to help inoculate that brew, bring that pH down and prevent it from getting mold and things like that. But the SCOBY has some really interesting defense mechanisms that it's evolved. So as you can see, it's incredibly dense. Like these are all the nanofibers of cellulose excreted by the bodies of the bacteria. And then this is like a yeast blob in the middle, trapped there. Um, so it creates a physical barrier that prevents things from getting into the brew. It then becomes that ship that goes from batch to batch. That barrier also prevents um, evaporation so that it can survive longer. And it also creates an anaerobic process below the surface. So when you make it at home, you might notice bubbles forming underneath your scobies. That's a really great sign. So when we say symbiosis, the reality is we are all in symbiosis all the time. Our bodies are a symbiosis. We are a conglomeration of numerous organisms working together. And the cool thing is, is most of the time we don't have to think about it. Like, we really live magic every day just by being alive. And that symbiosis extends to every single thing on this planet. We couldn't survive without the sun or the birds or the grass or the, the organisms in the soil. So we all live in, in several intricate symbioses. But how it works in kombucha is the yeast, being the party animals, they, they start eating the sugar right away. They're eating all the food, right? You can't have too many of those at the party or nobody will stay because there won't be any food left. Um, and then they excrete CO2, which is our oxygen, as well as ethanol. So alcohol is a preservative. Um, we kind of have some negative views in the United States about alcohol. We've got a prohibition hangover. We come from Puritans, so we're a, little, we're a little rigid in our viewpoints about it sometimes. But the reality is alcohol is our original medicine. It's what we dissolved herbs into to extract their nutritional powers. Those were our teachers, our original medicines were all from alcohol. And so what the alcohol in kombucha does is it acts as a preservative. It's there to prevent mold and other organisms from growing in it. It also serves as a nutrient source for the bacteria. This is where that symbiosis comes into play. So the yeast break apart the sugar from its disaccharide into its monosaccharide components, so from sucrose into fructose and glucose. And then um, that ethanol is consumed by the bacteria. They turn that into a whole host of healthy acids that support the liver, that support healthy liver function. So this alcohol doesn't intoxicate, it doesn't impair the system or inebriate, but it, um, it just has that mild relaxation, allows you to absorb the nutrition and preserves the culture. So you can see in these charts, if you can see them, the one specifically we're pointing at is this is the alcohol, these black dots. So you'll see over time, the alcohol is going to go up. But does it continue to go up like it would in an alcoholic beverage? Not at all. It comes right back down. And as this comes down, your acids increase. So this is that natural vinegar process. Whenever we make vinegar, we're taking something that's high in sugar, usually converts to alcohol, and then converts into our acetic acid. So this is, again, that vinegar process. And, um, and then you can see over time that those healthy acids really increase the longer you ferment the kombucha. But most of us aren't going to be really happy with a 30 or 60 day kombucha because it's going to be too sour. But all of this is about the bacteria, right? Because we are living in a bacteria world and I am a bacteria girl. Woo! They're everywhere, guys. They're all over everything. And we've been fighting germ warfare for a really long time. I think we're at some point we're going to look back and realize that you know Louis Pasteur maybe did a little bit more harm than good uh, after all. Because whenever we pasteurize anything, we end up removing those healthy elements that actually support our body that have that nutrition in a living form. Pasteurized milk, perfect example. So many people have become lactose intolerant because the bacteria that normally convert that lactose into other things are not present because we kill them all. And pasteurization has become a way to hide unsanitary practices as opposed to um, you know, being really conscientious and mindful about your practices. Now there is some risk in drinking raw milk, so I'm not saying it's a perfect with no risk, but life is full of risk, so you, you make those choices. But bacteria are everywhere, and they're amazing, and they're how we have been able to create this amazing super organ.
organism. They are the original life forms on this planet that over time figured out how to work together and create more and more complex organisms. You know, plants couldn't survive without bacteria because that's what helps them uptake nutrition in the roots. So just like the plants need the bacteria in the soil, we need the bacteria in the soil of our guts because that's what helps us uptake nutrition as well. And they're fascinating. They come in all these cool shapes and sizes, but the root of back means rod shaped. And so I've come to realize we are all a bunch of tubes. Human tube, dog shaped tube, plant tubes. Like we're all tubes with tubular appendages. I don't know what that means, but I think it's just kind of funny um, <laughs> that we can't help but look like the things of which we're made. But they have this really cool genetic fluidity. So um, when, a, when a bacteria dies, its cell wall might rupture, and that DNA now is free-floating in the environment. And other bacteria will come and absorb it. And this is the problem we have with superbugs. Like, because the sides, the um, antibiotics and pesticides, they never do a complete job of killing everything. And what that means is then other organisms can come along, take that, evolve that, so now, those sides don't work at all. And really, it's isopathy, which is like controls like. Because think about it like this. If there were so many bad guys, if there were so many pathogens, we'd all already be dead. How would we survive? Clearly, there are far more good guys than there are bad guys. And so the more we're cultivating those good guys into our diet, into our life, into our bodies, the bad, that's our force. This is your force. You have a microbial cloud, and that is the force. Isn't that exciting? Because it means you have control. It means you can take back the power. So the human body is a planet. We have wet, moist, tropical forests. We have dry deserts. And every part of our body has different types of organisms that live on them. And our gut is no exception. And that's really how we eat. I know we chew, I know we have saliva. That all breaks it down and makes it easier for the bacteria to do the work for us because they're the ones creating the vitamins. They're the ones creating the neurotransmitters. So there really is that connection between the gut and the brain. And we think this is the first brain? Uh-uh, this one is. Is it ever this one's out of order, but this one's fine? The other way around. This has to be in order first so that this one can function properly. And that's why paying attention to what we're consuming, not just through our mouths, through our tubes, but also what we're putting onto our skin and um, the other things we're using in our environment. But bacteria do a whole host of amazing things. They create vitamins out of, of foods. They create um, our immunoglobins. They are our defense system. So they really are incredibly vital to our, to our system and to thriving. And as, <laughs> so the way that I think of human beings is we're bacterial sapiens. Like we could not survive without bacteria. I feel like that term just encapsulates the vitality of that relationship with us in the natural world, with us in bacteria. And we co-evolved with these organisms over time and we have not stopped evolving. Like evolution isn't over, we are still evolving. Unfortunately in ways that we may not like because of all the toxins we put into our environment. We've had to survive. Um, those things. We've had to make adjustments and frankly most of our bodies have it and this is why so many people are so sick with autoimmune disease, with metabolic disease because you know the, carry, the canaries are already dead like we are we are evolving and it may not be for the best but hopefully by recapturing some of this good stuff we can uh, maintain our health. And so your bacterial toolbox should be full. It isn't just kombucha. There's no one thing like our advertising and propaganda machine wants to tell you. If you have this one thing, your whole life will be perfect. If you have this one thing, everything will be amazing. It's just not true. It's many things. And so kombucha isn't the end all be all. It's one of many things that help us. So your sauerkraut, your kvass, your kefir, they all, they all sour K. Do they all have vitamin K? Maybe. Um, so those are the things you want to keep incorporating into your life. Because we are the microcosm of the macrocosm. We are a manifestation. We are a stardust that has turned into these amazing beings. Um, and as you can see, everything ends up in a cycle. We're part of a cycle. And we feel divorced from those cycles when we live in a, an urban environment or when we live in a society that doesn't pay attention to those cycles. But I think we feel those cycles and we feel 
sad when we're not in connection with those cycles. I, I, I imagine here in Vermont, more people are connected to nature in those cycles than maybe in other places, but it's really easy to feel disconnected from that. And that's why gazing at the full moon we just had or walking in the woods, all of these things bring us a peace and connection because we know that we are nature. There's no separation. And we need to be around nature to, to absorb that sometimes. Now here's what's really amazing about this fermentation foods revival is because of course it's coming back right at the time when we need it the most. We are, we are a, a country in crisis. You know, we have epidemic numbers of these diseases. And look, there's numerous different things that you would never think have a common cause. But the reality is Hippocrates was right. All disease begins in the gut and let food be thy medicine. So if we take those two precepts, those concepts to heart, we really start to see how we can heal from things. We don't have to be on a regimen of pills for our entire life. Sometimes you do, sometimes that happens. I'm not, I'm not pretending to be a doctor to know everything, but the reality is so many times when you go in there and their job is to prescribe you medication, it's not to heal you, you end up on a negative cycle of constantly having to take more and more medications and then you never get well. There's never an end in sight, unfortunately, with this type of um, parasitic um, practice that has come into being. Again, not all of it is. I'm, you know, there's definitely a time and place for Western medicine, for antibiotics, they can save lives. So we're not talking about throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but we have a, an approach in the United States that doesn't take into account the fact that we are natural beings and that nature has so many answers and opportunities for us to heal naturally. And so we need to think about the soil in our guts. We need to cultivate that inner terroir. And of course, the foods we eat, the things we consume is one of the important ways to do that. But there are other ways in which we need to get bacteria into our lives. And that one of my favorite ways is through safe, healthy, non-threatening touch. Another thing that we're severely lacking in this culture. We've, we've so over-sexualized every interaction between human beings and we're so afraid of that that we don't realize how important it is that we shake hands or that we have a hug or even just a, a hand on the back can be really important and bonding and create oxytocin and all kinds of great things for us. And so here are some of the ways in which humans have populated their microbiomes. Uh, through grooming practices, through um, wet nurses, right? This seems really weird and foreign. Somebody else nursed my baby? Whoa, that's weird. But the reality is that's how humans did it for all times. You know, King, the queen didn't nurse the baby. That was her wet nurse. You would have women beyond childbearing ages who still would produce milk because their job was to continuously feed children. I mean, how amazing is that? Talk about abundance in action. Like, you don't even have to have your own child and your body can produce this life-giving nourishment. And then, how do we get our initial inoculation? It's through that, that first entry into the world through the vaginal canal. It's so fascinating. The microbiome of the vagina changes when a woman gets pregnant. And the bacteria that start to live in there are the bacteria that the baby needs in order to um, process the, the breast milk. It's the bacteria that they need in order to establish their immune system. And sometimes we have to have C-sections. And sometimes I don't, and sometimes I do them anyways. But unfortunately what happens is when you come through here, the first bacteria you're touching are the bacteria from the skin. And what they've noticed is that children from C-sections have a higher amount of um, asthma and allergies and things like that because their initial inoculation isn't the bacteria from the vaginal canal but from the skin. However, to counter that now, what we're seeing is they will do a swab of the vagina and rub that on the baby so that the baby does start to get some of that appropriate bacteria because once those bacteria take hold, it's incredibly difficult to change that microbiome. So really early on, it's important that you're getting that good inoculation. And as I can say, right, we're in toxic overload. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a government that cares about citizens, it cares about profit. It cares about um, getting paid off by businesses that want to make money off of your suffering. And that's a really unfortunate place to be in. But that's why we come to things like the Mother Earth News Fair, that's why we're here amongst our peers and people who think like us to create stronger communities, and we're kind of seeing some interesting things happening now. I'm not, I don't want to get too far into politics, everyone's got their predilections, but it's fascinating to see how 
um, communities are saying, you know what, those values aren't my values and we, we want different values and we're going to espouse those values and we're going to try to work towards that. And that's really how we're going to change the system. It's never going to come from the top down. I think we very clearly can see that that's not the progression. It's going to have to come from the bottom up and it comes from us. And if we're sick and if we're tired and if we're laying on the couch and can't even care for our families, how are we going to come together as a community? And that's why we need to get right in here, give ourselves some peace here. Oops, I touched something. Hopefully that'll go away. We gotta get some peace in here so that we can bring peace out there. There, okay. So how specifically does kombucha interact with your microbiome? Well again, we're consuming yeast and bacteria in a living form. They also have nutrition in a living form. Now again, these might not be mega doses of vitamin B or, or any of the vitamins, but they're in a living form. So when we look at an element, right, we've all kind of had to take chemistry at some point, we see those octagonal shapes or hexagrams or, I'm probably not saying that correctly, but all the shapes that join together with the bonds, right? Those are like keys. And so when your body has a key with the correct shape, instantly it can use that nutrition. Instantly your body can uptake that and do what it's supposed to do with it. When you have those things in a chemicalized form, in an artificial form, say in the form of a vitamin or something like that, the shape isn't exactly right. And so you don't quite get what you're looking for. And in fact, what they're starting to see is that you end up with the same issue that you're trying to prevent because you're taking it in a chemicalized form as opposed to in that living form. And remember, while it feels like we're feeding this giant human being, you're really feeding those tiny microscopic bacteria. And so having that, even in trace amounts, is really vital because that's who's gonna get the nutrition and that's who needs to help support you. And kombucha, like vinegar, um, specifically makes healthy acids that detoxify the liver. So the liver is where the liver helps you live. And so what it does is anytime you consume something and maybe it has a potential toxicity to the body, the liver's gonna sequester that and try to filter it out. And our body makes glucuronic acid naturally to help with that process. But as we mentioned, we're in toxic overload, so our bodies don't produce enough of that acid. So what happens is as it overaccumulates in the liver, it then gets sequestered to your fat cells. And this is why one you know, McDonald's or one bad choice isn't going to be the end of you, but it's a lifetime of those bad choices that accumulate in your body, and that's what leads to, uh, to our illness and to overtoxification. And so it's not gonna go away with one drink of kombucha, right? It's gonna be a process, and it's, a, it's an invitation to really understand and to get back into who you are. I know illness is not fun, nobody wants to deal with it, but by the same token, it really forces you to look at the choices you've been making and how you can improve them, and not only in your life, and hopefully inspire others through your journey. So we look at this laundry list here, and we think, oh my gosh, kombucha's a panacea, right? Based on the definition. Don't say that to the FDA. Don't say that. Don't tell anyone that a blueberry has whatever because they might tell you it's a drug and now you can't have it unless there's trials demonstrating its efficacy. That's the messed up world we live in. But the reality is, this might not happen for everybody. Every body is different and every body is gonna have a different experience. For some people they lose weight, for some people they gain weight. For some people it helps with diarrhea, for others it helps with constipation. Because it's not about the symptom, it's going to the root cause. And so the top three things we see, we hear people drink kombucha for is improved digestion, increased energy, and it just makes you feel good. How do you argue with that? Now why? Why is kombucha so amazing? Why does it have this reputation of being the tea of immortality, the tea of long life? Why has it been prized and cultivated and passed down even though it looks like a weird alien? Because it's made from tea. Go research tea, you will find a whole laundry list of, of studies and papers showing what an amazing plant tea is. Now tea is Camellia sinensis, so that's a specific plant. All tea comes from Camellia sinensis, so whether it's white tea, green tea, black tea, yellow tea, oolong, etc., that's all coming from the same plant. When it's picked, where it's grown, how it's processed is what gives it those unique and different properties. We call other things tea, it's a term of convenience, right? Peppermint tea, chamomile tea, these are not tea plant. And so while we might be able to use them in our primary fermentation, at least for our first batch, we always want to use just tea, just sugar, until the culture reproduces, and then 
experiment to your heart's delight. But tea is high in polyphenols, high in antioxidants, high in vitamin C, and those things are increased by the fermentation process. So you're getting even more of it. But it's not a cure. It's an adaptogen. It's something that helps you deal with stress. When you are in a highly stressed state, and what, like that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Like it's the one little thing that like sends you over the edge. Whereas if you're in a state of balance, when you're in a state of reduced stress and that same thing comes at you, you might not deal with it in that same way. And we are stressed out beings. There's fear and scarcity constantly being projected all around us. There's advertising and you should feel bad about yourself unless you have this thing. Like we don't have a culture that's trying to raise us up. It's trying to, you know, get as much of our money as it can. Um, so when we consume things like kombucha, when we do meditation, when we take time for self-care, when we really allow our organism to relax, we make ourselves stronger. I mean, stress is how we evolve. We can't live without stress. Um, I think we'd be sad in utopia. I think we'd be completely bored. We need stress. It's what helps us grow. It's what helps us evolve. And as they say, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, right? And that is what we're talking about. But having the right things in your life so you can deal with all the things coming at you is really important. So kombucha is just one of many things that can do it. This is our nature. It's diversity, it's not homogeneity. Mono everything, for the most part, is anti-nature, right? Monoculture, monocropping. Nature doesn't work like that. And when you walk out your door, is it one kind of butterfly, one kind of tree, one kind of flower? Of course not. It's, it's an infinite variety of those, and many that you can't even see all around you all the time. And so diversity of ideas, diversity of people, diversity of cultures, diversity of thoughts, these are things that enrich us, that make us stronger as a culture. But we have to have those healthy boundaries and create respect on many levels so that we can all live together in harmony. Can you tell them a peace and love hit me? All right, hopefully I'm with my crowd here. <laughs> Woo! So how do you drink kombucha? There's so much fear about kombucha. Who's heard? The Mayo Clinic says it'll poison you. Don't make it at home or you'll die of contamination. If you drink too much, you'll... It's food, people. How much broccoli should you eat? At some point, your body says, all right, I've had enough of that broccoli. I'm ready for something else. The same is true with kombucha. Now, because we're so out of balance, because our immune systems are compromised, sometimes we have what's called a Herxheimer reaction or a healing crisis. Our body might have to get rid of some junk before we feel better. And again, it's like layers of an onion. So while you might get rid of one thing over time as you continue to consume and get better and healthy in your diet, other things are gonna crop up. It's not that now you're suddenly sick again, it's more like as these toxins are being released from your body, they're gonna express at different times. And so if you're finding drinking kombucha um, is making you have one of those reactions, we always recommend decrease your kombucha, increase your water, allow the body to normalize, and then reincorporate it in small amounts until you feel it giving you a good lift. So some people say, well, you should only drink four ounces a day. We drink half a gallon to a gallon a day. Sometimes I drink none in, in a day. So it's listening to your body, it's trusting your gut, it's reaching for it when it feels good. And don't feel bad if you're really liking it and want to drink a lot of it. It's okay. Um, it makes a great soda substitute. Because you're making it yourself, you make it to taste. So it has its fresh ingredients. People end up falling in love with their own homebrew kombucha because their energy, right? Bacteria are alive. We're implanting our energy. We're making it with love, an incredibly vital ingredient missing from so many of those processed foods on the shelf. That really does make a difference. And um, it's just, you know, try, try the seven day kombucha challenge. Swap out whatever you're drinking on a regular basis, just substitute it with kombucha and see how you feel. You can go back to whatever you were consuming before or after that, but just see, does this make a difference? Do you feel a difference as a result? Now, of course, we have caveats. I don't know when it became uh, awful for pregnant women to eat any kind of food under the sun, and we have to be so paranoid about it because um, in reality, uh, we always gave the most nutrient dense, the most sacred foods to both the men and women of childbearing age because ancient people understood, again, that soil has to be nice and rich in order to create a fertile crop. 
And so um, kombucha and fermented foods is something that, again, trust your gut. I've had friends who love kombucha, got pregnant, couldn't stand the smell of it. That's your body saying, not for me right now. I've had other people tell me, oh my gosh, I loved it, I craved it, it helped with my constipation, it helped with my um, nausea, it gave me energy. So again, it's listening to your body. There's no right or wrong answer for any food. It's how does your body respond or interact with it. And again, you might just need to take a break and come back to it later. Same thing with kids. Kids love kombucha. Who has kids who drink kombucha? Do they love it? Love it! Right. They can't. Look, remember Sour Patch Kids, right? We all kind of like that sour sweet thing. That's what kombucha is. That sour and sweet. And in fact, sour and bitter are the flavors of health and digestion. Those are the things that make us feel good, that help our bodies run properly. Um, we're over sugar fight right now, and now we're doing this thing where we're demonizing all sugar. But consider the source. Is that sugar a high fructose corn syrup that's created with petrochemicals? Is it a, a chemical created in a lab that's known to cause cancer in rats, and yet somehow is still included in our food supply everywhere? And uh, in the states or cities where they're trying to do sugar taxes, like those diet drinks are exempted because there's no sugar or the sugar's low. Like what? <laughs> How backward are we? But then things like kombucha or coconut water, you know, are things that have to have a tax because there's sugar in it. It's, it's, it's kind of backwards. But the reality is that sugar is just a teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down. And kids love it. Immunocompromised, definitely you got to take it easy. You got to figure out what to include, when and where. Listen to your body. Trust your gut. Um, trust the instincts, the, the innate wisdom that we carry in our DNA that we've had, you know, billions of years of information encoded within every single cell of your body. Your body knows what it needs, but our minds have been programmed not to listen to our bodies. And that's where we're trying to, you know, bring those two back into alignment. Now those who have histamine allergies, they may not be able to consume kombucha. Their, their systems are in a state where any type of fermented food is going to create a negative reaction. So if you're trying it and you want it because you have other issues but it just isn't working for you, you might just go and find out if you have this histamine allergy to make sure you're including the foods that support you and excluding the ones that don't. So again, kombucha is not for everyone, but it is for most people. So here's how we do it. Ready for another song? Yeah. Kombucha tea. Easy as one, two, three. Brew sweet tea. Add a scoby. Wait a week and then repeat. Woo! All right. You'll never forget how to make kombucha ever again. It's that easy. But that's it. So what are the ratios? What is everything? Go to kombuchacamp.com. We have a recipe there you can download. The book, of course, has all the details. But it's really straightforward and simple. You follow this recipe, you replicate it, you scale it, and you will have literally infinite abundance in your home. And the hardest part is the patience, waiting for it to be ready. And that's why continuous brew is the easiest, safest, healthiest way to make kombucha. So most people will start with batch brew where you're making it a gallon at a time, it reproduces, you then take out the two scobies, you take out one to two cups of starter for your next batch from the top, you then bottle everything, flavor it if you want or not, and then you start that whole process over another seven to 14 days depending on your brewing conditions and taste preference. In continuous, we're using a larger vessel with a spigot. This makes it so much easier. Everything comes out of the spigot right into your bottle. So there's no like lifting the jar, there's no extra funnels, there's no things falling in the sink because everything comes right out of the spigot into the process. Well, you get the benefit of that longer fermentation the longer your CB goes, but then you're tempering the flavor with the sweet tea, right? We wouldn't like a 60-day, one-gallon batch of kombucha because it's going to taste like vinegar and not be very delicious. But if we're doing it in a continuous process, those acids are in fact increased because we're adding more sugar at a different stage in the fermentation process and that glucose helps us to make more of that glucuronic and glucuronic gluconic and glucuronic acid. We also prevent contamination because we're not handling it as much. So there's less risk of mold or other things getting in there. It also acts like a, a SCOBY hotel when you go on vacation, so it's very flexible. Or if you need to take a break, you leave everything in there, it just hangs out like a hotel. When you're ready to reactivate it, drain some sour stuff out, top off with your sweet tea, you're back to your kombucha in a couple of days. So it's very flexible. And um, mold is really, right, like all food. How do you know food is bad? It's got mold. Kombucha is just like all other foods. If you see this, don't drink it. <laughs> if you see this, throw it all away. And this is why we make a SCOBY hotel. We don't have to. 
But since the culture is so reproductive, might as well just keep a couple extras, just in case your neighbor gets curious and wants some. Just in case you have a batch that goes to mold. Now you have that, right? You know, you would think if I were coming from a pure salesman perspective, I'd say, you always have to use a new Scoby and you should always buy another one for me. But I sell infinity to you. I give you abundance because I want you to thrive. All right, and healthiest, right? Okay, so we talked about all these. The book, the book is amazing, and more information, we're on the web, we're on the social media, take pictures, tag us, we love that, all those good things. But before that was a great talk, Kombucha Mama. If people want to find out more, where do we need to go? Kombucha Camp, that's camp with a K, dot com. And you got a book? We do, the big book of kombucha. So it's not kombucha. I know I'm from the Midwest. Sometimes it sounds like that, but it's kombucha, K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A. Cha means tea. And um, yeah, you can find this everywhere. Is the book on Amazon? It is. All right, I'll leave the links to her website and the book in the description below. And we'll see you guys right back here next time at Lumna Acres.